Hi, thank you all for joining us this evening. I'm thrilled to see such a wonderful turnout. And before I introduce tonight's events, I wanted to thank the Committee on Japanese Studies at the Center for East Asian Studies and the Frankie Institute for the Humanities for their generous support in making this event possible. This is an event that has involved people from different departments, programs, universities, all working together to um, make this evening's conversation possible. So thank you. Only a short walk across campus from here on a squash court under the west stands of Old Stag Field at Ellis Avenue and 57th Street, Enrico Fermi and his colleagues at the University of Chicago engineered the first controlled, self-sustaining nuclear chain reaction on December 2nd, 1942. That original reaction may have been too weak to power even a single light bulb, but it sent ripples throughout history that can be felt by every living creature on our planet today. This fall, the arts organizations and departments at the university are coordinating a series of lectures, performances, installations, and screenings to mark the 75th anniversary of the Chicago Pile 1 experiment and its complex legacy. From architecture to music to film and beyond, Fermi's experiment reconfigured the aesthetics of modernity at the atomic level, including the rhythms of verse in literary traditions from cultures on the other side of the world. Tonight, we're fortunate to host a talk on Japanese poetry in the wake of the Fukushima disaster of March 11, 2011, the most catastrophic nuclear accident since Chernobyl. An estimated 1,600 deaths are believed to have occurred as a result of the evacuation that followed, with more deaths of cancer expected in the years and decades ahead. And the untold damage to environment, culture, and society in the first nation in history to suffer a nuclear attack remains impossible to calculate, if not to imagine. A new generation of Japanese poets has undertaken precisely this imaginative work of mourning the dead, of speaking for animal species, of envisioning possible futures after Fukushima, as our speaker, Jeffrey Angles, has documented in his work as a translator, editor, poet, and scholar. Jeffrey Angles is a professor of Japanese and translation at Western Michigan University. He's the award-winning translator of dozens of Japan's most important uh, modern authors and poets, including Arai Takako. He also writes poetry, mostly in Japanese. Please join me in welcoming Jeffrey Angles and Arai Takako to the University of Chicago. <clears throat> Uh, hello everyone, thank you very much for coming here. I'm thrilled to see such a full room tonight. I wasn't quite sure what to expect. Um, it was, uh, it, it's very nice to, uh, usually I'm on that side of the lake over there. If you go directly east, that's where I live. Um, so it's nice to be a few miles on this side of the lake for a change. Um, today, um, what, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, share with you just a very, very brief survey, a brief kind of introduction to some of the literary production that, uh, that uh, emerged in Japan after the, the nuclear accident uh, and um, all the other disasters that took place in the year 2011. Uh, so, uh, so the first part, uh, my part, is going to be mostly a kind of talk and broad survey. I thought that I would start with a couple of haiku, which were written by a, uh, a, a prominent haikuist um, by the name of Takano Mutsuo. A few years ago, he published this book um, called Man no Hane, um, uh, 10,000 Wings, uh, which won one of Japan's largest literary awards, Yomiuri Bungakusho. This book was published almost immediately after the, the Fukushima meltdown. And so um, there was a series of uh, poems in there uh, inspired by the disasters. Hiroshima, Nagasaki, then Fukushima flowers of darkness. <laughs> 
so here, right away, um, I wanted I wanted to introduce uh, our talk today by 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 uh, following up exactly what um, what Chiku had said a moment ago that uh, Japan, of course, is the first uh, country ever to suffer a nuclear attack, and then it also you know um, so in a way that this experience of Fukushima was. Uh, was seen in Japan as part of a long continuation, a long, very complicated and difficult history of, of nuclear energy and uh, nuclear power. Um, and we'll be talking about that uh, quite a bit over the course of the next couple of hours. But here are a couple of other poems by him. Uh, over my head, a hell of flowers or flowers of hell. And one more, from the spring heavens, the radioactivity to which we've given birth. I thought that this was uh, especially uh, important here because his his language we have given birth. The fact that you know we as a nation, the Japanese people, have allowed this uh, this to come into existence um, is something clearly that uh, is implied in here. I think that all of you know uh, about the, the the disasters in Japan, but I just thought I would uh, just mention them again briefly. W what exactly transpired before getting into to writing about it? Um, as we all know, on March 11th, there was a massive earthquake in Japan. This was the um, it, the earthquake took place about 100 and something kilometers off the east northeastern shore of Japan, um, and it was a uh, magnitude 9.0 earthquake on the Richter scale. Um, this is the largest uh, earthquake that ever took place in. Japanese recorded history and the fifth largest earthquake ever recorded in world history. Um, it was large enough that it changed the tilt of the world's axis and moved the, the country of Japan about 15 feet further out into the Pacific Ocean. So the entire country was affected. And you can see all throughout the country like which regions uh, where the earthquakes were, were felt the most strongly on this map. That, of course, produced the tsunami that then uh, crashed into the northeastern Japan uh, coastline and produced the uh, Fukushima meltdown. Um, so uh, the, the point I think I want to, uh, to make in mentioning these three, three things is that, you know, in Japan, the experiences of the events of March 11 are experienced as a whole, in a way. The, uh, it's very difficult in people's imaginations to separate sometimes the earthquake and the tsunami and the, the nuclear meltdown because the, the, they were so intricately um, intertwined with one another. We see that over and over again in the literary responses to the, to the disasters, um, that, that people are reacting not just to you know, one part of those disasters, but, um, but very frequently people are reacting to, to the outcome um, across the board. Uh, there were earthquakes uh, over and over and over and over and over and over and over in Japan after the uh, the massive one that took place on 3/11. Oh, by the way, for those of you who aren't in the know, uh, in Japan, the, this event has come to be known as 3/11, using uh, "santen ichiji" in Japanese, echoing the kind of language that we use in English to talk about 9/11. And uh, of course, this is no coincidence because this March 11 disaster um, in Japan became sort of the dynamic event that, that has shaped much of Japanese policy and uh, Japanese cultural development in the years subsequently, just as 9-11 shaped much of what um, happened in the United States um, in subsequent years. There were so many earthquakes all throughout Japan um, in the eastern coast. At the time of the earthquakes, I was, you know, I was uh, in Japan close to here, and uh, the earthquakes were coming about um, every two hours for, for days and days and days and days and days and days and days on end. When the, uh, when the rubble finally cleared, we realized that, um, that a massive number of people were dead. Uh, 15,000, almost 16,000 people were killed. 2,000 some people were lost, presumably considered dead um, as a result of the tsunami. Uh, there were over 6,000 people who were wounded. 20, uh, 235 billion dollars in immediate damages. More than a million buildings were destroyed, and it's been called the costliest uh, natural disaster in all of world history. Um, just the Fukushima cleanup alone uh, is estimated at 175 billion, and um, this number I pulled out of the newspaper probably a year ago. The number is constantly going up uh, as as it becomes clear and clear how difficult the 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 issue is to to resolve. Uh, near uh, the Fukushima reactor was located right here on the coast, and um, very soon, within a very short time, the government said uh, uh, that. 20 kilometers radius from the from the number one reactor there, for the Daiichi reactor, there was there was uh, there was an evacuation zone put into place, and people were not allowed to to return to that area. So what this means is that several towns, you know, right around, had to be completely 100% evacuated, 
and, um, and that process is still ongoing. Actually, Takako um, has just been to the, to, the, to, the, to the nuclear zone very recently. She went there about two weeks ago to take some photographs for you, and so she'll show those in the second half. But uh, the, the evacuation order was lifted earlier this year, and so people are officially allowed to return to certain parts of these towns. However, very, 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 very few people have. It, it still is mostly a ghost town in this, in this region. The nuclear reactor, of course, is still being cleaned up. Um, here's a photograph that I took off of Google Earth about a year ago. You can see that all around the reactor, there are, um, there are gigantic barrels, and these are gigantic barrels of water that are being used to cool the overheated reactors. Um, and because there's no place really to take these highly radioactive pools of water, they're just being kind of stored on site until the government is able to figure out a better, pro more proper way to, to deal with them. And I think it, there, there's um, a lot of ongoing discussion about the best ways to deal with this. But the human costs are still, still absolutely out there. Um, even if we look at um, Google Images shots of the areas surrounding the reactor, we can see that you know the, uh, these towns are still largely abandoned. Fields are overgrown. You see that there are no cars out here. Yeah, there's, there doesn't seem to be any sign of life anywhere on, on the grounds whatsoever. So um, this is still the case even now, right today. Um, before, I, before I talk uh, uh, about poetry a little bit, I just wanted to say uh, a couple of things about Japanese poetry for those people who maybe who aren't so familiar with that world. There are a number of different genres of Japanese poetry. I think everybody in the United States is familiar with haiku. Um, we've all learned about haiku, I think, in probably second grade or third grade, right? When we we're learning about what syllables were. Uh, but actually, there's, uh, there are three uh, genres of, haik uh, of poetic production that, that dominate Japanese po poetry, um, even today. Um, one of them is tanka, you know, which is produced in this 57577 metrical structure, um, usually like printed in a single line of text. Um, this is one of Japan's oldest forms of, of poetry. It's still being practiced in a very, very, very big way today. Lots of people are, are writing haiku now, uh, tanka now. Several hundred years later, um, more than a thousand years later, uh, the, the front part of the haiku broke off and became its own independent, uh, the tanka broke off and became its own independent genre, the haiku. And so this has about 400 years of history. The other form of history which um, Takako and I are practitioners are of is, is uh, called shi in Japanese. And this has sometimes been variously translated as modern poetry, free verse poetry, or poetry in the international style. This refers to the kind of longer forms of poetry that developed as Japanese poets came in contact with Western style poetry and uh, began to break away from the metrical forms and patterns um, that, that, that existed up until that time. Today, uh, I, I, I'm going to be talking largely about poetry that was written in this third genre. And uh, it's not because I want to dismiss the work that was, the very important work that was done in both the genres of, of tanka and haiku, but simply because of the, the length of shi, because it's a variable, free form style of writing, it becomes possible to produce quite long and complex responses to the Fukushima disasters. Whereas in the shorter forms, um, such as tanka and haiku, it becomes difficult to say much beyond kind of a documentary or kind of commemorative impulse. So m much of the, uh, the examples that I'm going to, to show you come from this genre today. I should finally add uh, that there's, a, that there's a, no single word in the Japanese language that refers to, that corresponds exactly to the English word poet. People who write tanka are called a kajing. Uh, people who write a haiku are called a haijing. People who write shi are called shijing. And um, typically, people operate in one genre almost exclusively. There are very few poets who cross the borders of, of genre. And so these fields have been somewhat, somewhat um, separate in Japan. There are a few counterexamples, people that have written in all three, but they're they are very few and um, extremely unusual. So post-311 poetic responses. Um, the poetry world was very, very quick to respond to the, to the 311 disasters. There were, all throughout the country, massive numbers of fundraisers held. Poets started banding together, doing public poetry readings, producing journal issues, producing books, and all sorts of other things, CDs, uh, and the like, which they would sell to, and then uh, and then give away the the money that they had uh, collected as donations to people who had suffered in the Northeast. Um, there was a lot of music that was developed. 
because music, of course, is able to be composed quite quickly and uh, extemporaneously, um, sometimes even, um, there was a massive number of, of pieces of work uh, produced about 311, including some of the poets that I'm going to talk about today. Some of their work was set to music um, and is still performed in Japan. Uh, there were exhibitions. Poets and uh, manuscripts started traveling in Japan and internationally. There was one particular group, uh, an NPO, that collected together um, haiku, which were written by 55 poets in the Northeast. And they brought, for instance, their, uh, their, their poems in large calligraphic writings um, to several places in Japan and then also to the United States as well um, in order to raise money and to raise attention. The Museum of Contemporary Japanese Poetry, Tankan Haiku, which is located itself in the disaster zone, after recovering, they decided that they were going to host a year-long exhibition dedicated to poetry. This uh, exhibition, uh, featuring manuscripts about the uh, disasters written by various poets, was such a success that this um, Bungakukang, uh, this museum, decided to host a second year-long exhibition, and that was such a success that they went on and did a third year. So this place actually um, really did a great deal of work to showcase um, poets and their voices. So as I mentioned before, poetry was the first literary genre to respond to the disaster. Part of that, of course, has to do with the fact that poetry can be written quickly, it can, it can be published very quickly. And so immediately, immediately, within two or three days, poetic responses began to appear in the newspapers in Japan. Poetry took over um, spaces that are not typically occupied by poetry. They took over larger spaces in the newspaper. They, uh, they began to appear on television. A lot of com uh, Japanese commercial companies who had commercials slated to appear on Japanese television suddenly felt very, very uncomfortable with putting their happy, kind of cute commercials in front of a grieving Japanese public. So almost all commercials disappeared from television overnight. And instead, the um, Advertising Council of Japan stepped in and produced the PSA, with, uh, with, which had poetry running uh, in the background as one of its responses. They, they, they resuscitated an, uh, a famous poem from the 1930s um, about the importance of civility and kindness and ran it almost nonstop on Japanese TV where, wherever there was a break uh, where a person had pulled their advertising. So actually as a result of that poetry like emerged into the space that typically is not reserved for poetry and um, it had a profound impact. Almost anybody who was in Japan in March of 2011 remembers this poem being repeated over and over and over again on, on Japanese television. It uh, became one of the most enduring memories of the disasters. More importantly though, poetry um, uh, took a, an important space in the, in the national psyche because it allowed people to respond. Um, it gave a voice to affected people both on the individual, kind of smaller local levels, and on the national level. Um, people were writing poetry everywhere in the country, and I think it's almost no exaggeration to say that virtually every poet in Japan wrote something about the 311 disasters somewhere within their work. It was almost impossible to ignore. Poetry uh, participated very much in the national processes that, that tend to follow disasters. Um, after any disaster, a nation goes through a process of mourning, a, a period of um, anger and protest. And in fact, the poetry, uh, the, the, uh, the anger and protest is still ongoing. There was an exploration of, of a great deal of trauma, and, and the kind of special language of poetry allowed people to, to, uh, to do that in new ways. And, um, and I hope in some ways that, uh, that poetry helped in the healing process somewhat as well. One, one final thing that I'd like to mention just quickly is that um, yeah, a lot of poetry before the 311 disasters in Japan was relatively playful, very personal. There were small kind of coterie magazines in which people were writing to each other and back and forth, kind of exchanging poetic voices with one another. But I, after the 311 disasters, it suddenly became difficult to engage in that style of poetry in the same way, with the same intensity. And there was a, a marked shift in the, in the Japanese poetic uh, production towards what I'd call communicative poetry, poetry that had a strong message, that had a moral, and, um, and that was presenting that moral to the Japanese public. Poets use their kind of privileged space on the, on the uh, cultural stage in order to use that voice. So uh, as a result of that, like, you know, poetry moved in a direction of becoming, moving away from a language play towards, uh, towards social relevancy.
I'm not saying that it wasn't socially relevant before, but you know, but I think that people felt like a strong need to kind of respond to what was happening in the society at that time. Partly because I was in Japan and I was quite literally shaken up by the uh, by the disasters, I, I started like looking at um, at poetry, uh, this poetry that that flooded out of uh, Japan um, afterward. I wrote an article about uh, poetry in 2014 and 2016. I published this anthology. There's some copies of it back there, which brings together a bunch of poetic voices. But really, this collection is just the teeny tiniest tip of the iceberg. And um, I've, uh, every time I go to Japan, I, I come back with a stack of books this high, filled with, uh, with new poems that are being published, responding uh, to the newest phase of the, the disasters. So there's constantly uh, uh, new, vo no, new voices emerging. And, uh, and so this is, I think, a, a project that could end up taking somebody's entire life if they wanted to do it. So really what I'm going to introduce to you today is just the smallest tip of the iceberg. I wrote about this a little bit in the book that, that's over there. When, when I was reading the, the, at first the dozens, then the hundreds, and now the thousands of poems that were written about the 311 disasters, I, I, it became clear to me that there were several functions that these poems were performing. One of them was a documentary. Poetry was a form uh, that, that people used to document their experiences, what was happening to them on the ground. People use poetry in, in a eulogistic, commemorative fashion to talk about the things that they had lost, the villages, the towns, the people that were gone. There were, uh, po people use poetry as a, as a means for, uh, to search for meaning. Uh, in other words, people were asking, when, when they kind of turned to the universe and asked, well, why did this have to happen to us? You know, poetry was one of the uh, vehicles that they used to do that. And, um, and this is quite, uh, quite related, but uh, people, those people who are looking for meaning in the disasters frequently uh, would turn to, to protest when they, when they found the answers. So there was a large number of, of, of uh, anti-nuclear protest pieces that emerged out of 311. Um, there was environmental protest, um, discussions about like, the way that humankind existed in relationship to the environment. Um, there was cultural protest. People were like examining the culture that produced the nuclear reactors in the first place. So th there were various forms of uh, protest poetry that emerged, and they still continue to emerge um, in an important way today. Finally, um, the, the fifth uh, function of post-311 poetry that I want to mention is something that's a little bit harder to, to describe in a single word. But one of the things that, that became clear as a result of the 311 disasters was that the kind of you know, playful, insular ways that a lot of people write poetry are not really sufficient to deal with a catastrophe on this kind of scale. And so um, writers begin to debate uh, amongst themselves about the best ways to write about disaster. Um, they begin to debate the role of art in social change. And of course, these are debates that are always going on within any kind of literary or artistic uh, milieu. But uh, what happened here is that, is, is that the 311 disasters just gave these questions a, a much stronger um, impetus. I don't want to say that like, you know, a, a, po a particular poem might belong to only one category or another. Um, typically, it seemed to me that these functions often oversected and in, in, interlapped in very interesting and productive ways, with, um, often within a single piece of writing. So let me give you a couple of examples of poetic responses to, to 311. The most famous poet to emerge out of the rubble of 311 was this fellow, a fellow by the name of Wago Ryoichi. Um, he was born in 1968. Um, and he was, he was a moderately well-known poet. He had had a couple of prizes to his name before the disasters. But because he was from Fukushima and, uh, and experienced the disasters in Fukushima, he was evacuated from his home and was not allowed to uh, return to his home for several days. You know, he experienced uh, the Fukushima disasters in a very intimate and powerful way. And almost as soon as the electricity went back on at his home, he turned on the computer, set up a Twitter account, and started started posting immediately. And the piece that he produced um, as a result of uh, his, his Twitter posts, his Twitter posts were later collected and published first in this uh, magazine of contemporary poetry, Japan's most important um, poetry magazine. In their special issue, which dealt with the 311 disasters, um, it came out in May. Uh, the April issue was already out at the time of the, or was already in production at the time of the, the 311 disasters. So the first issue that dealt with this massive, massive cultural uh, and national disaster was the May issue. 
they featured Wago Ryoichi as kind of the main poet, the main voice of the disasters. So in other words, his tweets were, uh, 44 pages worth of his tweets uh, were reproduced in, in this form. A few months later, in June 11, uh, in June of 2011, his entire Twitter feed up till that point was uh, published in the form of a book. And this was a big event. This became probably the most famous piece of literature about the disasters produced in Japan for the first, for the first couple of years. Um, it took a couple of years before novelists were able to respond. And so nowadays, we're, we're getting more and more and more novels being published about the disasters. However, it was poetry that really dominated the discourse at the beginning of the, um, of the problem. And, uh, and this book was the one that attracted the most national attention by far and away. Wago Ryoichi was invited to every radio station, every TV station. He appeared hundreds and hundreds of times on, uh, in the media. Because he, had, because he found himself in so much demand, he began to do all sorts of things. He began performing constantly. He had lots of interviews. He produced book after book after book of poetry. He was publishing for a while there a book about every three or four months of poetry. Uh, I'll, I'll talk more about some of the reactions to it in a second. But first of all, let me, let me share with you a, a sample from that book, Shino Tsubute, uh, Pebbles of Poetry, the, his, his Twitter feed. When we read this, it becomes clear that to him, you know, because he was there in the middle of the disasters, Fukushima was an ongoing thing. And to him, it still is an ongoing thing. He's still deeply involved with the, with the disasters and the relief efforts. For him, he sees Fukushima as an unresolved trauma and, and, uh, and a reason that the Japanese population should be angry and, um, and uh, engage in more social action. And he really calls upon artists to, to become a part of that uh, social engagement that's going to provide the solution. He, when he, the book started, uh, Pebbles of Poetry, uh, as I said, so these were all written on Twitter originally, but, um, but he, it became very clear within about 10 or 15 tweets that he conceived of his tweets as a massive, gigantic poem a kind of ongoing uh, poem written in a, a form that's a bit like automatic writing, um, in which he's you know, dealing with the things that are in front of him. He writes very, very early on, I think it's the third or fourth tweet in this book, he says, everywhere I go, there's nothing but tears. I want to write about this with all the ferocity of an ashra. And Ashura is a, is a Buddhist demigod, a kind of scary demigod. What he's saying is like, I, need, I feel like I need to write about this with power and with passion and not the kind of dull, staid language of traditional poetry. Um, he follows this immediately by saying, radiation is falling, it is a quiet night. So you know, here he's juxtaposing his own need to, to kind of produce a loud, angry voice um, with you know, the quietness that he sees everywhere around him. What meaning could there be in harming us to this extent? Here's where he begins to kind of move into sort of the, what, I, what I would call the meaning-making mode. And uh, very quickly, you know, he begins to, to ask questions about the radioactivity. Uh, they say the radioactivity is un enough to immediately cause abnormalities in our health. If we turn the word immediately around, does it become eventually? I'm worried about my family's health. He goes on, if we were to search for meaning in all this, it's probably not meaning we would find, but rather something close to the darkness of non-meaning, that temporary stillness lodged inside whenever we look at things head on. As I was writing this just now, the earth rumbled again. Everything shook. I held my breath, got on my knees, and glared at the trembling till it was over. I'm gambling with my life. In the rain of radiation, I am all alone. He continued to write uh, for, for many, many days. And as the Fukushima disasters began to unfold, the Fukushima um, reactor began to play a larger and larger part in this book. He wrote, um, after visiting on March 25th, after visiting a public bath, he wrote about that experience. We sweat, yet another man says, I'm afraid of the plutonium above all else. Of all the things we've seen so far, I think that's the worst. A cold sweat covers the soles of our feet. <clears throat> Someone in Watari was saying something. What? It's okay for Kushima to be angry, even anger, angrier than it is already. A cold sweat covers our foreheads. In the blazing heat of the sauna, I think back on how the spring, my son's elementary school did not have a graduation ceremony. Angry against what? What? Blame what? What? One official made the mistake of saying only the gods know what's going on with that nuclear reactor. So then, blame the gods? I let the rain fall over my heart. A cold sweat covers my soul. I might have reached my lament. We sweat a cold sweat. The man starts talking again. They're working at the electrical plant without sleeping or resting. They only eat twice a day and nap in the hallway. All the workers' families are terribly worried. I started to wish I could see my grandmother who died a decade ago. 
So, you know, you can see like in, in this, uh, in this poetic, this isn't kind of traditional poetry. However, um, you know, we, we can see very quickly that he kind of veers between the, the meaning-making type of poetry and very kind of personal commentary uh, on his, his particular situation at the time. And so this, this kind of tension between uh, dealing with something, a uh, kind of more universal problem and the extremely individualistic manifestations of this problem is a tension that continues on throughout the, throughout the entire book. He went on uh, in, in the course of his many, many, many books that he produced. He uh, produced one book called this, um, Haido Shihan, which is filled with poems about the Fukushima reactor specifically. And I just thought I would share two excerpts from it. I provided you the entire poem um, on the second page of your handout if you'd like to read it eventually. The reason I gave you this handout is because I hate reading poetry in excerpts, you know. But because of time, it's only really possible for me to kind of introduce some of the, some of the major themes here. But, um, but this poem, the title poem that starts out this book, he says, 40 years until the reactor's decommission starting now. But in my speech, how many years will it take to replace reactor with decommissioned reactor. How long is it going to take, in other words, he seems to be asking, for the Japanese consciousness to change and uh, to kind of move beyond the point where we're relying upon this thing as, a, as an, a given entity in our society and kind of moving past that to the next stage of our society. This poem is very interesting uh, in that it's written, like all Japanese poetry, vertically on the page. And, and so a lot of the, the uh, parts of the poem look like little pieces of radioactivity falling down you know, across the page. And he uses this dramatically over the course of the poem. It's difficult to produce in English because English, you know, we have to turn everything on, a, on the side this way. But this is one thing that he was consciously doing uh, in this particular poem. Um, but after producing a series of images that, that show kind of snapshots of what he's seeing around him in Fukushima, um, he comes to this, the penultimate per, uh, stanza. He says, the floods of our language assault the pathways of language, the gulfs of language, the highways of language, the things at the sides of language, the voices of the people weeping and calling out in the sprays of water, cars and houses and electrical poles and Mars and ballpoint pens and Venus and the gloves I lost in my previous life. Don't you realize that all these things have washed up onto the spring shores of our ideals? Like, you know, here he's quite like literally reproducing the, the kind of flood of emotion that, that, that moves through language and that moves through experience. The thing that ended up motivating him to write so much of his work. The flood of language begins to kind of overtake the, the container in which he's held language. And so the, the result is this very, I would call, a very, very messy poem, which is filled with like lots and lots of um, images that, that kind of try to capture the various um, snapshots of what's going on around him. I'll share with you just one final poem that, that, uh, that Wago has read a great deal in his, in his public uh, performances since 311 and 2011. This is a poem called Resolution. It starts out saying, In Fukushima the wind blows, in Fukushima the stars shine, in Fukushima the trees put out buds, in Fukushima the flowers bloom, in Fukushima I live. And I live Fukushima, I love Fukushima, I do not give up on Fukushima, I believe in Fukushima, I walk through Fukushima, I call out the name of Fukushima, I feel pride Fukushima, I hand over Fukushima to the children, and so on. Later on in the poem, after talking about a number of things, uh, he moves into a stage where he begins to try to reclaim Fukushima through language. I will protect Fukushima, I will take back Fukushima, I will take Fukushima in hands, I will live Fukushima. And he begins to kind of play with the Japanese language at this point. I will live to Fukushima. Fukushima ni ikiru. I will live Fukushima. Fukushima o ikiru. I will live in Fukushima. Fukushima de ikiru. I will live Fukushima. Fukushima o ikiru. He's basically just changing one small you know, piece of, uh, one small piece of grammar in each sentence in order to produce a variation. So this became a poem that he read very, very, very frequently, and the crowds love it. <laughs> the, the crowds love it. And um, the, the crowds that love it tend to be not the kind of crowds that really typically enjoy so-called, like, difficult-to-understand literature, the kind of, you know, pure literature that, that, that uh, Japanese uh, textbooks tend to, to introduce to students. It's a, it's a much kind of more visceral and down-to-earth kind of language. And I have to say that, like, a lot of poets hated him as a result of this. They said, uh, you know, the, the criticism flowed very, very, very quickly. 
people, a lot of people began to say, well, gosh, you know, like, look how simple that, that reaction is. I will, I will live Fukushima. I will love Fukushima. You know, like, you know, that's, that's like, that's like kids play. That's not even a real poem. There were poets that, that criticized him for being, like his poetry for being too much like journalism rather than real poetry. And there were a lot of people who criticized him for sort of profiteering off his position as uh, unofficial poetic ambassador to Fukushima. I think that the criticism personally is not entirely fair because you know, I do know that he's spent a huge amount of energy giving back to the, to the region. And so uh, it's not as if he's just putting money in his pockets and walking away. Maybe partly because of sour grapes, a lot of poets were quickly r r eager to uh, level this uh, criticism about to him. One particular poet, um, I thought I would share his criticism in more detail because this is the kind of the most poignant and, uh, and cutting criticism of any that I've seen so far. Uh, this is made by a poet by the name of Morinaka Takaaki. Um, he wrote in the, the magazine Gendashi Techo a long uh, piece of criticism called um, Catastrophe and Language, Katastrophe to Kotoba, um, in which he wrote this. Wago Ryoichi's practice since Fukushima is, to cite the Mar Marxist critic um, Onishi Kyojin, an incidence, the worst possible case of collusion with popular sentiment. Moreover, at the same time that he's pro proclaiming his love for his homeland of Fukushima as a victim, he's never, ever, not even once, pursued head-on the legal political responsibilities of Tokyo Electrical Power Company or the other political authorities and related organizations behind what was clearly a human-made disaster, namely the horrifying accident that took place at the Fukushima Daiichi nuclear reactor. Instead, what this poet has done is merely to take his position as a victim and the emotional reactions that arose from it and translated them, to cite Pierre Bourdieu, into his own cultural capital, consolidating a position for himself as a poet, which he had not been able to accrue to that point. Both his poetics and his po political ethical standpoint, without a doubt, are of the most negative type, the worst type, in the world of contemporary Japanese literature. I should add out that, like, I put these words in, in emphasis, but the emphasis is actually there in, in Morinaka's <laughs> original. He's like, you know, he was so angry at Wago that, you know, it, came, it comes through literally on the page with the, with, the, um, with the emphasis. Also, this kind of parenthetical sort of mean-spirited sniping was also there in the original. So um, I just I, sh I share this um, uh, this criticism to just uh, as a way to show everybody like the how high people felt the stakes were about the modes of representation in which people engaged um, in the years immediately following 311. Uh, I'm not entirely sure that this uh, that this is wrong. Um, this particular criticism is wrong. However, I do think it is important to remember that Wago's writing opened up an entirely new audience to poetry that probably wouldn't be enjoying, wouldn't be participating in poetry ordinarily. So, you know, I, I think it's all right. The world is large enough to have different kinds of writers writing in different ways. And so I, I know that's a shocking c conclusion here, but it's something that sometimes people very, very f quickly forget in their, you know, um, arguments about the right ways to do things like writing. One of Wago's very, very um, intense and fierce critics was this gentleman, and I'd like to share a little bit of his writing next. Well, uh, Takashi Mutsuo is one of Japan's most prominent poets. He was born in 1937. Um, I think he's a super genius. If anybody knows me, they know that I translated a lot of this fellow. But he was just named uh, by the Japanese government. Uh, he, was, uh, he was given a very prominent uh, uh, recognition uh, for his work of, in poetry over the years. He's done an enormous amount and is staggeringly original at every turn. He wrote uh, immediately after the disasters this. After Japan's defeat in World War II, there were a number of poets who drew upon T.S. Eliot's The Wasteland, wanting to start again, using The Wasteland as a point of departure. Now, if we were to draw upon their example and start again from the wastelands left by the disasters of 311, we must recognize that the wasteland is really within ourselves. In other words, it stems from the spiritual destruction of desire and idleness that has, at some point unbeknownst to us, started growing rampant within us. Even before we were victims, we were victimizers. As long as we fail to recognize this, our words will lose their weight and circulate emptily. He's not saying it very directly here, but, what, um, but when you read his poetry, it becomes really quite clear that what he's saying is that we, as the Japanese people, have kind of lost our, our spiritual bearings in the world. We rely upon consumerism, easy comfort, and infinite consumption in order to kind of fill our souls. 
and Fukushima, which quite literally turned off the lights you know, for, for an extended period of time in Japan, forced us in the darkness to recognize who we really were as human beings. The fact that we were constantly exploiting the environment and the fact that we were you know, living this kind of life of easy comfort that was fundamentally unsustainable. So um, he writes about this at great length in, in his work. Um, it becomes clear that to him, Fukushima represents nature's revenge for humankind's abuses of the environment and even the laws of nature. He calls the, the, the act of deriving energy from nuclear processes uh, as, a, um, as a form of a perversion of the laws of nature. So I'm sure he would have been very critical of Fermi you know, here uh, mm -hmm. if he was standing on the stage. Here we see, uh, we, we see that message contained very neatly within this poem called These Things Here and Now. This poem begins this way. It was not just daily life as we once knew it that the black wave of March assaulted. The dwarf god imprisoned under tight control suddenly escaped, swelled before our eyes into Daimajin, the god of great trouble, filling heaven and earth. The people set adrift, whole settlements at a time, not just one village, not just one town, but an entire country. No, the entire world entered an endless era adrift. Here, what he's talking about, the dwarf god imprisoned under tight control, he's talking about the, the nuclear reaction contained within the, within the reactors. So, you know, this is what we get when we pervert the laws of nature this far. He goes on to say, let us collect our thoughts. What is nuclear power? Mother's greatest gift to humanity? Or rather, the miscarriage after the child rapes and impregnates its own mother. You can see quite clearly, you know, what his attitude towards nuclear power was. Isn't it true that we shut a demon in a cage and force it to work, then when its power was gone, we had it buried alive? Isn't it true that the buried, anguished corpse has regained its breath and has returned, harboring its anxiety and fear for revenge? Now is the time it reveals its secrets tucked away. So, you know, his, his idea is that, like, you know, unless kind of humanity and Japanese civilization in particular reevaluates its relationship with the environment, its relationship with the laws of nature, its uh, relationship to consumerism and consumption, that this is a problem that is ultimately unsolvable. And, and that's the reason that he says later in this poem, we are not comforted, we are not purified. The reason is that our grievances and our protests are finally against ourselves, our avarice, our idleness. We cannot be easily comforted. We cannot be easily purified. We must be scorned over and over. We must be beaten over and over. His solution to step back and to kind of step back from the uh, podium of ego, as he once called it to me, he was specifically talking about Wago Ryoichi there, S step back from the kind of podium of ego and listen kind of calmly to the voices of the dead, the people that were killed by the tsunami, the victims of the, the Fukushima who are not able to kind of voice their own problems. We need to listen to those people. He says, Will we be fortunate? If so, we must prick up our ears all the more. We must turn our eyes to what has remained. The mute words of the countless dead snatched by the waves, the silence of the swelling numbers of displaced withstanding privation, and the brilliance of the youth who have stood up from inaction, supporting them as none other than the silence of the dead and displaced. What we must learn is their anonymity, their gracious unconditionality. For the sake of time, there was another poem that I'd like, uh, would have liked to have shared with you. I think I'm going to, to leave, leave this. It's in the handout. Um, this is a poem uh, which, uh, which he wrote uh, about the same time. I, th it was th I think this was written about five or six months after the Fukushima meltdown began. Uh, and he considers this his favorite poem. He considers this his most successful poem. Um, the name takes its title, obviously, from the famous no a novel by Gabriel Marcia Marquez, Lovers in a Time of Cholera but here he's changed it to be lovers in a time of nuclear power. Again, this is, a, this is a, a poem that repeats the themes in the poem that I just shared, so I'm not going to read through all of it, but I just wanted to say that, you know, here's another example of him kind of expressing the same style of um, criticism. And as a little bit of a plug to introduce our, uh, our next guest, um, I want to introduce one of the, I think, most brilliant poets in Japan, um, Arai Takako. So to her, uh, she's written a number of poems about Fukushima. She has provided, in my opinion, some of the most interesting and trenchant criticism of the Fukushima disaster, and not just like you know, the kind of environmental protest uh, that, that Takashi produced, but also kind of a larger cultural critique of the Japan that gave rise to the reliance upon nuclear energy. Uh, Arai is a poet who 
does a great deal of social criticism in her work overall. She's written a great deal about the 2008 economic shocks, but uh, you know she just sees the Fukushima disaster as one of a series of contemporary crises that reveal the fragility and gullibility of the Japanese population. Her poetry frequently shows the particular and potentially problematic ways in which contemporary Japanese society has developed. And she tries to get at the kind of ideology that underlies the, the cultural reliance upon nuclear energy. In conclusion, I think that I'd, I just would like to include the voice of one local poet. This is a gentleman um, um, named Kojima Chikara, who is a elderly gentleman born in 1935, and he's spent a lot of his life as a um, anti-nuclear protester in this region. So when the nuclear meltdown began to happen in 2011, he was right there documenting and writing about it in poetry. Um, he's not a poet that's known on the national stage, but the Fukushima disaster gave him a platform to be heard for the first time. Just this year, a book was published, a bilingual collection. I picked it up in Japan um, earlier this year um, called My Tears Flow Endlessly. Um, and in it, uh, there's this poem. It's a poem um, called Killer. The true killer in this society is probably hidden and raised secretly under a veil of radio waves, letters, and words. The true killer without color, shape, or smell can be seen by nobody. The true killer who targets every creature on earth doesn't discriminate targets. The true killer who is the lethal weapon has no need for any hidden weapon. The true killer who is intruded and accumulated in the body can never be eradicated, though it reduced by half. The true killer who makes sure to do its work and take its time always gets in the way, even if people remain unaware. The true killer who conceals itself in a village full of money cannot be arrested even if its crime is discovered. The true killer who is dispersed into the unexpected place, no creatures but loaches can live in contaminated soil. The true killer, they tell us, doesn't affect our health immediately. The true killer is, therefore, in this society, most probably, without a doubt, legal. So, again, this is probably not the type of poetry that might have kind of emerged onto center stage before 2011. It's extremely direct, it's extremely communicative, it's not particularly playful in its language. But I think that one of the things, uh, and one of the reasons that I wanted to conclude with this particular poem is because I wanted to show that the particular nature of the disasters opened up a space for different kinds of writing that you know typically might not have come to the fore in the in the playful years before 2011. So I think I'll stop here. Thank you.